don't necessarily have the traditional hour of you know, preparation, that three mile jog, and the, that threshold work and the strides that you would maybe do if you were running a mile on the track. Instead, a lot of these guys probably have hardly even moved today as the gun has gone off. You know, some guys maybe will jog a mile just as slow careful not to burn any of those very valuable carbs that they've worked so hard to get in their bodies beforehand. And other guys, it's just adrenaline. They're able, the gun goes off and they're able to just tap right into that pace because they're excited. Either way, the warm up obviously critical for athletes, whether you're a sprinter all the way to a marathoner. They're up front here, we've got Matt Yano kind of pushing the pace. What do you think about that today, Kyle? Uh, you know, he's definitely someone who will benefit from an honest race. He had mentioned yesterday in the press conference that he was working on his speed more specifically last year to get the body queued up for those faster paces. And he's also now being coached by Ryan Hall, who is someone that has never shown fear before in races. And so this might be coach's plan. You see the tall figure there in the center, Brendan Gregg, many time All-American at Stanford, has made his home on the roads from just down the street here. I believe he's from Davis, California. Stayed, stayed around, now running for the Hanson's Brooks Project. Something else that is definitely worth mentioning is the elevation of this course. Unlike a lot of races, it's actually a net elevation down. They're, they're gonna be dropping somewhere around 300 feet, just over from the start to the finish. And for that reason, that's why we're here. That's why so many people are here. This is a great opportunity for a lot of these athletes to come out and get their Olympic trials qualifying time. Especially because this race, for whatever reason, always has perfect weather. People are not afraid to get after it, despite not having any rabbits in the race. And this is just an opportunity. Let's go walk a little bit. That's good. And just as you talk about the net downhill, we've got our first major hill <laughs> it appears in this early ongoing here. I doubt this will test anybody as they're just comfortably rolling now. The first half of this race is just slightly more hilly as we're coming through the first mile in about 507, 508, which is not fast, not too slow. I'd say it's about perfect. I, I think that's where you want to be. And over here on the right side of your screen now, that's the women's field. That's Emma Bates out front. And there's Stephanie Bruce on the near side with the teal headband running for the Northern Arizona Elite Squad. So those are basically exactly who we estimated would be up there in the women's field. Sarah Crouch there in the white cap. And then that's my dark horse pick, Megan Christian. They came through the mile in 539, which is, again, probably more or less, it's, it's honest, it's sub 230 pace. It's, Fair, and these four women are all sub 230 capable, especially with the help of the men. They're able to kind of just tuck in. It's definitely more likely to be an honest race on the women's side for that reason, having the same start time as the men. You can see a little conversation happening out there. Maybe a little fandom, who knows? <laughs> so my dark horse pit, Megan, the reason why I'm picking her is because she's just sewn extreme consistency in her marathoning. Her highlight of her career is perhaps her seventh place finish at the Olympic Trials Marathon in 2016. She's running for Mizuno and splits time between her native Long Island. Uh, she's just coming down from a stint in Flagstaff for a little bit of altitude. And then she's also spends quite a bit of time in DC. So jumping around, but she is someone who has proven to just always be there and in a race like today where you know we've already sort of seen the separation of the women of four or five that are really out there with the intention to win i think that she's going to be there for a long long time we'll certainly see and on your left of screen here this is malcolm richards richards running for the west valley track club 
set his PR here last year on the CIM course. And that is a 213.29. So he is, without question, a contender in this field. It's really comfortable to come back out to a race that you've already succeeded in. You've executed the plan before, so you know that you're capable of it. You know that it works. And it's just a matter of doing it again. So he probably feels quite at home here at CIM. small gap is just starting to form. It's nothing serious. They're not going to let him get completely away, or I wouldn't expect him to, but Matt Yano just has a few steps on the field. Running fearlessly <coughs> up front looks to be very much in the zone, but in control. It seems that such an important part of running the marathon is not necessarily running anyone else's race. It's all about running yours. Yeah, especially in these early miles. You just have to do what feels right. And you can't get dragged out too fast. If someone's running one or two steps faster than you and that doesn't feel like it's your cadence, then you just gotta let it go and know that if you run your race, they will hopefully come back to you. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people, it, it's, it's hard to sort of reconcile when thinking about their own running is out here with these elites. Gaps can be closed. Yeah, quickly, especially in these early miles. It's a lot just of personal taste, and I'm sure Matt isn't even recognizing the fact that a small gap is forming. He's just got his head and his eyes looking straight ahead, and he's doing his own thing. And the guys, again, they're not going to let him get away too early. This is a, a deep field with a lot of fast guys. And we'll see that second mile split soon, but that first mile was nothing crazy that these guys aren't capable of matching. So you've got Matt here wearing half tights, and you see quite a bit of guys in the back with short shorts. Rob, I got to ask you, what do you think? Which way would you go? Well. I've had an evolution in my day. Being almost 40 years old now, I was a short, split shorts guy forever. And then as I got older, my peers really, really started making fun of me. And so just to add to that, I started wearing half tights, which I don't think helped my cause at all. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully it helped your chafing. <laughs> it's the only thing it actually helped. I would say though, having done a handful of marathons and, and getting out there and running long distances, now I'm, I'm a Clydesdale. I, I've, no stretch I'm out there trying to run fast but just enjoy doing it um, I definitely go with the half tights for the longer things how about you Kyle um, short shorts always make me feel fast so that's always the way which I would go I just would shave my legs that made me feel really fast so there on the right side of our screen we see Tyler Andrews he is a 215 marathoner himself he's the 2016 Mohawk Hudson River Marathon champ, which I always think is a really interesting thing because a lot of these guys have run major marathons throughout their careers and wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to win a race. You know, if you're entering only world marathon majors, you're going to need a 204, 205 on most days. But for these guys who are now entered here at a U.S. championship, it's not just about time, it's about race strategy that comes into play. So seeing guys who have proven that they can win marathons is important in your analysis of who are the contenders. And Kyle, another interesting note that you and I have certainly talked about is the evolution of the marathon here in the U.S. specifically. You know, we've traditionally in the past, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't have too many young 20-somethings out there competing at this high level in the marathon. They were traditionally sticking to the track and looking at running the 5Ks and 10Ks and trying to make their Olympic dreams come true on that particular surface. But more and more, as people start to recognize their talents, they're more eager to jump up to the marathon at younger ages. I mean, Emma Bates is only in her mid-20s, mid to late 20s, right? So th there's just there's things about this that are uh, unique and different, and we're seeing an evolution there's uh, actually Mario Frioli, they're number 479, if any of you read the, the Morning Shakeout <coughs> pot, or, uh, blog. Yeah. He's a good little writer. Well, so anyway, the reason why I think we're seeing this, this uh, evolution 
evolution of younger runners moving up to the marathon is probably mostly motivated by money, as terrible as maybe that sounds, but there's just a lot of money to be made on the roads versus the track, especially on the guy side. You'll see a lot of 358 milers who have just been going again and again and again, but unfortunately 358 just doesn't pay the bills the way a great marathon would. And so people are chasing the money. There's great appearance fees out there. There's great bonuses. There's a great prize structure as we've seen today. And so it's an opportunity and people aren't necessarily waiting. I think there was this idea for so long that if you're not fast enough to run the 1500 as you get older, you move up to the 5K. And if you're not fast enough at the 5K as you get older, you keep moving up until you find your spot, which oftentimes will be the marathon. Yeah, you see that prize money there is exactly what we're talking about, Kyle. Like the first place is 20K. I mean, for so many runners out there, that's gonna be more or e equal to or better than any kind of contract that they've got with any uh, any sponsors. Yeah, and I think another important thing as mentioned is in addition to just the prize money here or maybe their base salary in their contract, a lot of these athletes will have huge incentives in their contract, not only for placing well at US championships, but for running really fast. And so there's a huge incentive to also run quick in the marathon, not just run well in it. I guess the incentive works then, huh? Yeah, and I think that's why we're seeing, so, again, so many people moving up at a young age, but I think internationally, that's why we're seeing times continue to drop. I think a few years ago, this idea of the sub two marathon was so far and it was uh, this this idea that seemed out of reach and so impossible, but as people are moving to the marathon earlier and earlier and the top, top talent is doing it in the peak of their careers, all of a sudden a 201 world record, a 159 doesn't seem too far-fetched. We've been having this dialogue for many, many years and there have been advocates and naysayers, all the above and a 201 marathon pretty gets us pretty darn close to that sub two hour I know at Bannister's day they thought that a sub four minute mile would stop the heart so certainly there is opportunity for growth and expansion and if you're getting towards that finish line and you can see where 159 would be then I think it's possible so we saw on our screen Sarah Crouch who is another athlete that is coming back pretty quickly after a recent marathon she had just done Chicago and so in a similar position as Steph Bruce, who she's running next to, but almost in a more awkward position, having just a little bit more time, I think Steph just had to recover. You know, she is focusing j on New York and she takes a week easy, probably just jogged, maybe did a couple light workouts and then she's out here, focus being recovery. But the difference between Chicago to the CIM is a little bit more substantial. So it's interesting to see or it would be interesting to know exactly what she's done in training to prepare her today. Yeah, you mentioned Steph Bruce there. You see her on the far left of the screen, uh, the upper right corner here in the Northern Arizona Elite top and the teal headband and arm warmers there. Steph, you know, really has come a long way. She's one of those people that was, uh, you know, pretty decent in college, but sort of a late bloomer on the national and international scene, having made some international teams as well and, and and really coming out here with a kind of a fresh perspective she's a she's a mom you know there's a different kind of thing that happens now as she realizes that she's running for more than herself in so many instances um, just just really fascinating to watch her career blossom and her desire to continue racing and now bottom left of screen here Matt Lotto just not paying attention to anything or anyone taking his hydration getting ready to go and he just seems like He's ready to run his own race, Kyle. Yeah, he's in his own world out there, which is not a bad thing. And you know, you're, no you're noticing him taking down the fluid <laughs> super early in the race, which, you know, he's probably not necessarily too thirsty yet, but if you're not preparing for the later stages of the race now, you're gonna regret it later. And so he is taking his time, getting the fluids down, which is probably some mixture of carbs in there, some sugar, just a little bit of calories to start getting the body ready for when the racing actually starts. Although, for him, it may have already started. Yeah, 
And the chase pack here is a little bit of effort to head out there and chase some things down. This is Sergio Reyes, the Hoka Aggie Running Club. He's got a 213.34 under his belt. He was, in fact, the 2010 U.S. Marathon champ. So this, this race back in 2010, he took home the W and surprise money. I think that you've got to keep an eye on anyone who has run 215 or under today. Jumps happen, and especially the difference between a 213 and a 212, or just a, a minute or two difference, could just be the difference of one course versus another, a few degrees in either direction. And so it's easy to read into someone's PR a little bit. Oh, that guy's a 211 guy. I'm only a 214 guy. I can't necessarily beat him. But in the race like a marathon where every course is so different and every day is so different and you have so few opportunities compared to a mile on the track, it's definitely the sort of thing where it's anyone's game. Now let's talk about that. That's, that's an interesting um, component to racing the marathon. You can't just go out and keep racing them to try to like chase PRs. It really has to be such a concerted effort in every instance, whereas, you know, you, for example, you go hit the European C circuit every summer and you're like racing once or twice a week. Yeah, it's a little bit nerve wracking to be only two opportunities in a year. These athletes are building up, most of them at least three months with one goal in mind. Many of them, their entire year is planned around one specific marathon. And for these athletes here, this is all part of their greater plan for the Olympic trials preparation. And it puts a lot of pressure on each individual performance, which in many cases may bring out the best in athletes, and in others, it's scary. That's, that's a, those are the sort of nerves that might cause an early mile cramp, but these are athletes who've been waking up early and running the 7 a.m. start times for a long time. These are probably the athletes who succeeded most in cross country while in high school and college. And so they're used to this one race means everything sort of situation. And I think that's why we've seen, you know, if you follow some of these prominent athletes on their various social media channels, one of the unique things we see practicing all the time is that hydration, is the bottle pickup, is like the, the, the nightmare scenario of missing your bottle or missing that opportunity for fuel and hydration just can really wreak havoc on, a, on an athlete that's trying to go out and race for over two hours. Yeah, you're seeing Emma Bates there on her screen taking down a gel, which in a debut marathon is something that was probably a big focus of her in practice. Just learning to digest while running, not everyone has an iron stomach, and so it's an acquired ability. It's not easy to be breathing heavy and taking down eight ounces plus of fluid and it is certainly something that takes some getting used to. A more veteran athlete like Steph Bruce, who's been running marathons for years, it probably comes second nature at this point. And we jump back here. Here's Dione. And Sch Schlitbein. You know, D Dione, garnered a little bit of fame a few years ago. I think it was 2015 when the race where Meb had won Boston one year and then came back and raced the next year and they finished at the same time raising hands as they crossed the finish line. She continues to just continue to race. She formerly ran for the BAA now out running for a different club there but you know these uh, these two ladies sitting here contesting for those top 10 finishes on the women's side. Yeah, and she has a 234 PR, which is great. I mean, uh, that can quickly become a 230 PR today. And so she and Bethany have found each other, it seems, early. Almost seems like they've planned this. They're just running side by side in stride. And they are not chasing the front pack. They're doing their own thing. They're checking the watches. They've already received their 5K split, and they know what their mission is. And you just hope if you run your race that those up front will come back to you. I think that's an interesting point there, Kyle, is that 
the farther you get in your career, you've raced against and with so many different people, and you kind of just start to know who's going to be generally running your pace. And you could probably seek those people out on the race course. I think whether you're on the track or on the roads, you just kind of know that we're going to be running this pace. And, you know, there's always those side conversations at the start line. Hey, how are you, how you feeling? What are you going to go out in? What's, what are you doing? And then the classic response, I haven't done any speed work yet. Yeah, which I think is okay in a marathon. You can get away <laughs> with that. So Emma's just breaking away a tiny bit, nothing too substantial, but she's got a few steps on the women as they passed four miles just a few moments ago. She's running fearlessly, which is really cool to see. Uh, there's definitely probably some level of enticement to just hang back and think, let's get that top seven and solidify the championship victory. But she's going for it. She's got some ambitious goals in this race. And you see the camera here passing the full field back from the, the lead women's pack all the way up. So, so many athletes out there doing what they do best. And that's just pounding the pavement. And your current leader really just kind of inching himself away from the pack. Matt Lano, Yano, excuse me. Just really looking for what appears to be a substantial win with substantial time. Yeah, he came through the 5K in 1534, which is just a hair under five minute pace, which I guess is about 211 marathon pace. So it's with, certainly within his ability to be able to maintain this. The question is, what mentally will this tax on him in just terms of by doing it completely alone? The, the pressure is on him knowing that they're chasing him. The pressure is on him to maintain that five minute mile cadence without any help. You, you're never tucking in and kind of shutting that mind off, which could be important in a race that's over two hours long. And you see right here after Emma, this, well, you're, you're as your screen, we're, we're doing our best here, but that was uh, places two through five. Matt's continuing to push away. His stride looks very strong. He's got a pretty pronounced arm swing, which is sometimes a little less traditional in the marathon, but you can tell he's a marathoner because of where he's landing on his foot, just very comfortably in the back middle. He's got that little bit of a Mo Farah-like back kick, but he's always been someone who's just excelled as the races go longer and longer. In college, it's easy to think that you know, you can't run a 1500 fast enough. Who knows if you're gonna have the future in professional running. But a guy like Matt, as soon as he graduated and started moving up in distance, he found immediate success. Was quite an impressive half marathoner straight out the gate. And one of those unique things about racing in college is you never truly get to test those upper limits of, and thresholds of distance. I mean, the farthest you're ever gonna race in college is that 10 kilometers on the track or, or cross country. And so many of these guys and gals, they're built for these longer punishing road races. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. You know, we look at this, there's a lot of very similar stride lengths, except for Heron Lagat. He has such a fluid, long stride relative to the rest of the guys in this pack right now. Yeah, that's certainly true. He stands out for that reason. He's probably got a little bit more of a bounce in his step since he's used to going over some hurdles. He's actually been, uh, made a name for himself by being one of the greatest steeplechase rabbits out there. Certainly capable of running fast himself, but has paced quite a few impressive races in his day. And moving up to the half and full marathons is, you know, while still an impressive steeplechaser, it's hard to make the steeplechase team in the U.S. these days. Yeah, it is. Uh, you've got a number of guys who are capable of under 815, and especially with a guy like Evan Jager up front, you know, that's that's one spot that is almost almost solidified every time a U.S. championship comes around. So, and he's now, I believe, 35, Heron. So he's uh, looking to longer and longer races, and that just makes sense. And those longer races, that debut in the half marathon not too long ago, running just a shade over 61 minutes, which for a debut half marathon is quite impressive. And I think just given his own interview following that race, he was pretty ecstatic. Yeah, I think he maybe surprised himself a little bit. And 
you know, I think a, a big thing that he's been doing is just bumping that mile. That mileage is now, he said, over 130 miles a week, sometimes topping out at 150, which is something that when you're on the track, you're not necessarily going to be able to do because to run 150 miles a week, but still be clicking off sub 60, 400s, uh, it seems like you'd have to make a trade off one way or another. And now he can just freely run, get those miles in. The, it's just about time on feet in many ways in the marathon. How how much can you run while allowing the body to stay healthy? Just finding that edge that allows you to make to the line as much in one piece as possible, but to the fact to, to be in a position in which 26 miles no longer scares you. I hope to never be in that position. Yeah, it's a, it's <laughs> certainly a, a unique position that these uh, athletes have been working a long time to be in. And again, you see Emma Bates there on your right of screen, currently leading the women's field, running for the Campfire Relief. It's in partnership with the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, who's done something pretty amazing, as they were directly affected there, being in Chico, California. They, they and a thousand other breweries put out Resilience IPA as part of a fundraising effort. As their neighbors in, in the town of Paradise, California, basically doesn't exist anymore. And there's a lot to be done, and, and kudos to Emma for being a sponsorless athlete right now and taking the opportunity in this highlighted uh, field and being a prominent athlete to draw attention to something that she believes in. Yeah, she got quite emotional, and rightfully so, during the press conference yesterday and so she's running for something that's a little bit bigger than herself and that's a motivating factor that certainly can propel her to the next level today if not her fitness and she's one of those interesting ones i know we've kind of touched on it uh, a little bit kyle but you know running 80 miles a week before and trying to you know run these longer distances and now just like cranking and dialing up the mileage to, to 120 is something and, and being out there in the woods running you know in the high mesa in, in outside of boise idaho she's really found something in a gear and, a, and an engine here that's allowed her to move up to this marathon feeling pretty good about it yeah the difference between 80 and 120 miles a week has been doing incredible things to your body i mean for the first you're gonna definitely feel almost invincible when you're running that much it's just an unbelievable amount of fitness in the legs if you can make it through a block of training like that and it's probably part of the reason why she's running so fearlessly right now she's not even acknowledging the fact that she's dropping the field she's just tucked in she's got a looks like a little smile on her face i it's again we're only 30 minutes in but i like what i see and she is unsponsored right now but this is the sort of race where she might open up some eyes as we said before, that the, the marathon tends to bring out more prize money because there's exposure out there, you know, run, running in those majors. You know, someone we haven't talked about here is Laura Masterson. She's in the yellow kit and the high neon green compression socks. An Adam State grad. She was four times the national champ, D2 national champ, now coaches at Trinidad State. Um, this She does have a PR of 237.41, so without question, given some significant training like this is not a scary place for her to be yeah she looks completely within herself right now and they've dropped megan Kripchen just a little bit uh, at this point in the race it's hard to know if things are calculated or not this might very well be a little surge that was thrown in a few steps in front of her and she's decided not to go with it but sarah crouch and steph bruce are setting a nice tone there not too far behind emma you know, there's a similar sort of etiquette in the long distance running as you would find in cycling. You saw Steph Bruce there did a little side point. She's letting the runner behind her know that there was a pothole. You know, there's like, like hey, we're all in this together. There's not, I'm not trying to take advantage and run you into the into a post or cut you off or box you in. They know they're out there for a long time and maybe Steph's gonna need someone else's help down the road. So there's a kind of, just an interesting dynamic in the relationship between these long, long distance runners rather than those competing on the track sometimes. You're really battling yourself out there. That's the the first and foremost most important competitor.
So an interesting fact about Sarah Crouch before the Chicago Marathon, just a couple weeks before, she had been noticing quite a bit of pain in her legs and didn't necessarily know what was going on. She had gone and visited the doctor and initially it was kind of ruled to be nothing, but eventually they found out that she had a pretty serious leg tumor and just in the upper thigh, I believe on her left side, and they had to go in and obviously remove it and luckily everything went very smoothly and even just a couple weeks later she was able to go out and be the top american in chicago so quite an incredible recovery for her and an exciting thing for her to be able to come back out so soon after and just keep it going what might deter and derail plenty of people will never do that to the, the mastic masochistic marathoner that all they want to do is run and uh that's a, a true testament to their, their grit and determination and, and really seeing her cross that finish line in Chicago as the top American just was a, a pretty special moment. I think a lot of people have seen images of that and certainly the stories. But, you know, one of the unique things I, I think about, Kyle, is that a lot of these athletes, as we've noted, with the exception of Emma being an NCAA champion over 10K, many of them don't necessarily come from ridiculously good collegiate track pedigrees. You know, they, they tend to move their way up and find this marathoning as a, as a skill set almost, as a, they, they've got the right tools, the VO2 or the grit, whatever, the, the form, whatever it might be to actually land them in the marathon. And even, you know, in doing our research, how many of these ladies, especially would, you know, you could say were middle distance specialists in college and somehow have moved their way up to the marathon. Yeah. Especially women's cross country, it only being 6K on the collegiate level, you're not necessarily getting the opportunity to show your full ability if you're an aerobic monster like these women are up front. And so they blossom late, and especially the marathon, it's something that takes a lot of years of just the miles piling up upon each other. And if you're not running after college necessarily if you call it quits and move on at 22 23 because maybe you didn't have the success you wanted you may have never reached your full potential at your true distance and that's why i think you see a lot of these women in the you know 30 range who have just been running 100 plus miles a week for so long just continuing to get better and better and better and their 800 1500 prs from 10 years ago are now completely irrelevant Absolutely, and you saw back there in the back of screen, mile seven, here's Matt Yano, still just just kind of pulling away. We have saw uh, in, in the previous screen down the hill, the chase pack does not appear to be getting closer, more so farther away. Yeah, Matt hasn't necessarily picked it up. He was just a shade under five minute pace at seven miles, which again is, should be relatively comfortable for him. It's probably the pace that he's highlighted in practice and has been running again and again and again for every workout. He's just dialed in. He's, he's probably just second nature again at this point. Just a 75 second 400 feels right. He's not worrying about what others are doing. Just focusing on him. What do you think he's thinking about? <laughs> um, I'm sure he's trying to not to think, uh, try not to think too much. Probably trying not to look back. Although I'm sure he's curious what's going on behind him. But it, you need a lot of positive self-talk in a marathon. You need to be reminding yourself you're cued into your body, and you need to be saying, "I feel good. This feels right. I'm where I want to be." And if you just constantly remind yourself of that, it really does produce the the freshness in the legs that you want seven miles in and the chase pack here middle of the screen that's Ian Butler so Western State Division two runner trains in Boulder Colorado it's been a part of a few different groups including the Hudson elite now if I'm not mistaken I believe the Boulder Harriers another group there in Boulder having produced a decent crew of you know cross country half marathon and marathon runners Malcolm Richards, though, still kind of leading that chase pack. With Heron Legat back there in the white jersey, kind of just biding his time. You know, with a 61 and change half marathon, 
under his belt, this actually probably feels pretty darn comfortable. Yeah, we'll check in again in a few miles. <laughs> Mile 14, perhaps. And on the left side of our screen, we see Anthony Costales, who has a 213 PR we had spoken about earlier. But I think such an interesting thing is a lot of these athletes run a half marathon a little over a month out to tune up, to gear the body for the marathon. They often do it in pretty heavy training. And Anthony had a pretty non-traditional tune-up race. He actually won the Moab Trail Marathon, which some indication of how much more difficult it is to run on the trails. But that victory was in 2.59. So about, you know, 40 <laughs> minutes difference between the two surfaces. Now, I've done a few races out in Moab just for fun, but I can tell you that it's either soft sand, packed dirt, or hard slick rock. And so there's nothing consistent about anything you're doing out there. And, and the trails just off, you know, offer a completely different type of challenge. Here, it is all about rhythm, and it's about pacing. I imagine, though, when you're out there running on the trails, it has so much to do with not rolling an ankle and being able to shift and turn and pivot because you have to make tight hairpins and whatnot that just do not present themselves in this type of scenario. It's truly a different skill set. It's a, a different sport in many ways. There are athletes who maybe have no exposure to trails in their life. They've always been running on the road since a young age, and you get them out there on a rocky and rudy run, and all of a sudden they are hurting, and it's, a, it's an acquired ability for sure. And again, Matt Lano taking no prisoners. You see the chase pack, but still not a lot happening. In top right of your screen, Emma Bates making some friends. All of the different genders. So for all we know, they're, they're there to help her as much as anything else, not, not by design, but it probably is kind of motivating to be out there racing with the top loop woman. Yeah, it'd be nice of them to help her out at different points, uh, allow her to tuck in, and then, uh, you know, she can uh, hopefully coast for a little bit there. And just a little bit earlier, Kyle, we talked about sort of the biomechanics of marathon. You were looking at Matt Yano's form and talking about his arm carriage and those things like that. When I think about the ideal marathoner, I think of compact, I think of a lower stride cadence, and I see all of that in Emma Bates. Yeah, you can especially see at the bottom of her shoe, you can almost see her entire foot come up and cycle through. Like her heel is tapping the ground first. And it's just a pretty energy efficient way to run for a long time. It's also a good way to stay healthy when you're running the amount that she runs. It, it probably means that the, the speed work in college didn't come super naturally for her, but this is really her element. And back there to Dion. She'll continue to keep racing out there. We've got a few other athletes. I'm sitting in about the seventh, eighth, and ninth range, I believe. on the screen there, a pretty non-traditional outfit of no shirt but arm sleeves. The woman we see on our screen there is Sam Roker, a graduate of Providence. Uh, I believe uh, a 238 marathoner in her own right. And our first blind runner we see there with the guide. It's just such an impressive thing to me every time I've ever seen that happening in any races. Kudos to both the athlete and the pacer and the guide. Just, uh, just a tremendous partnership and level of trust and needed to Say, I'm going to go out and do this thing I can't see, and I depend on you to get me to that finish line. That's just, a, just an incredible relationship.
Emma continuing to look comfortable. An interesting thing about a lot of the athletes in this race is how many of them are working jobs in addition to running. Emma's actually a nanny and finding a way to squeeze in the running career. Uh, she's, she, I was talking to her earlier this week and she uh, absolutely loves the family that she's working for. So if they're listening, just know that Emma's uh, pretty happy with you guys. <laughs> Gotta squeak out that living some way. You know, I, I, I think, and Kyle, you can maybe uh, attest to this one way or the other, that sometimes it is okay to have something secondary to your running during the day to have your head a little bit clearer sometimes that it's not all about the worry. It's great to have nothing else to do when running is going really well, because then you can go home and really bask in how good you felt in your workout, and the, you can celebrate that, and as you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix, taking a nap, you're just really feeling quite good about yourself. But it's on those days where maybe you can feel great that having some other activities in your life to help distract your mind really, really becomes beneficial. And we've got our group of four here chasing Emma. All working together. My dark horse, Megan Pripchen, has reattached. So maybe that was a calculated play to just let them get a few steps on her. Now let's talk about that a little bit, Kyle, because I think it's really, really important, uh, seemingly, in the marathon to you know, tie that bungee cord on to the group you're trying to pace with. Yeah, you know, it's funny because unlike in cycling or NASCAR, at this pace, drafting really is relatively irrelevant from a physiological point. Your the benefit is hardly existent. But mentally, that's really where the benefit lies. You're able to just shut your mind off, not think. You can drop your arms down a little bit. You're just staring at someone's back, and you have the opportunity to just zone out and not think because you only have so much mental energy over the course of the race in addition to physical energy. And the best scenario likely that the athlete can get there, it stay in the pack, and then the next time they look at their watch, they've gone much farther than they thought. Yeah, if you could fall asleep for a few miles, that'd be nice. Just past mile eight here, Emma pulling away from her competitors a little bit. Now, eight miles in, maybe for a lot of folks, still seems like quite a ways. Uh, they've been racing at a sub six minute pace here for eight miles, but she really is still in the infancy of this race. And I think it's pretty consistent that we talk about the race really doesn't start until about 20 miles. Yeah, especially in a race like this, on a course like this, the final six miles is just a very gradual, gentle downhill. So the goal is almost just to make it to that 20 mile mark with life left in your legs so you can take advantage of that. If you're holding on for dear life at that point, the downhill is not gonna feel as good as it would if you've got a little spring in your step and you can lean into it and just roll. And just to point out too that Emma is on roughly, we'll call it, 228 to 229 pace as she continues to roll through these miles just kind of clicking off those 540s roughly pretty consistently I think everything that Emma has done in the last year or so has really shown that 228 is realistic she at the USATF half marathon championships was just behind Molly Huddle and while uh, losing in the final straightaway just being so close to someone of that caliber late in the race is just a huge confidence boost. And then you see how well she ran in New York and just how well she always runs. And all of a sudden you think, maybe I'm that fast as well. And taking that momentum and bringing it here, 228 seems right. Matt Yano there on the bottom left of your screen, current leader, just he, he almost looks like that Cadence is picking up. He's got his fuel. He's taking a nice little downhill stretch here. He's just going to kind of enjoy it. I mean, he, he really just seems like he's uh, kind of firing on all cylinders. Yeah, I mean, you, you hope to wake up on race day and have an on day. And I think he woke up on the right side of the bed. Again, we don't want to celebrate too early because we're only 47 minutes in. But clearly, he's 
feeling himself right now. He, he likes what he's got going on. You know, it's interesting, in addition to just racing himself, Matt Viano and Sarah Crouch, two athletes that are part of the McCurdy training group uh, that coaches athletes remotely. So besides just them, they've got supposedly multiple athletes that they've prepared for this race today, just a little bit behind them. So I wonder if maybe he's curious how they're doing. I'm sure he can't help but think and the, the, the level of giving back and maybe making a little bit of money in the meantime with your expertise is, is something that, you know, you guys are all experts. This is something that you can give to other people and, and really help bring along and motivate and inspire people to achieve something along the marathon course that's, you know, pretty pretty darn impressive. And again, let us know what's going on out there, guys. Hashtag USATF Marathon. I was talking to Matt earlier in the week just about the difference of training now under Ryan Hall uh, compared to what he experienced when he was with NAZ Elite. And he said one of the big switches that he made is to tracking not miles, but just minutes. So rather than saying, I'm gonna go out for a 10 mile run and stopping when the watch clicks, he just goes for 70 minutes and 70 is enough. And we've got a little bit of move happening here. This is Cosguy, Daniel Cosguy, the Nike athlete is running for the army. He's, he, he must have his own mental permission now to kind of get after it and close that gap. Yeah, once you start to get, when you get to a certain point in the race, you kind of get over a mental barrier and say, you know, I just want to get to 15K feeling good, and then maybe you're warmed up, you know that you're having a good day, and you're just allowing yourself to start taking some chances. And no one goes with him. He's, it seems like a pretty definitive move for his part. I think he's tired of letting Matt running by himself. He is trying to hawk him down, but this might take a, a couple miles to fully close this gap. Well, I think that's the patience involved in the marathon is that the, the gap doesn't happen over like a quarter mile. You know, this has already been eight, it's been eight miles in the works or more for Yano to have created that gap, so you can't expect to close it in the next half mile. Something you do have to be careful of is the number of moves you have in a marathon is limited. You can't attack, 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 attack. This isn't the Tour de France. You really are limited to one or two hard moves, and when you make them, they have to be done definitively. You aren't necessarily gonna come back from a couple fast miles that are gonna up the heart rate, put you in the tank, put some lead in the legs. Instead, you have to really be careful and make sure that you're bordering on the right side of that threshold. And you know, interestingly enough, I think we've seen in, in championship racing over the years where some of those moves, if, if they knew what was happening up ahead, they could have continued those moves and perhaps changed the outcome of Olympic teams. And my recollection is the struggling Desi Linden struggling Shalane Flanning at the Olympic trials when Amy Craig won and, and Kara Goucher not seeing, not making that team, but coming so darn close had she known what was happening up front, maybe having a slightly different outcome. And so those those moves are just wildly important. And if you just had the vision to see that far up, you know, sometimes things can change. It's definitely easier to run a race if you knew what happens. <laughs> You see they just came through 10 miles. Uh, Sam was just under 51 minutes. The pack at about 51 minutes as well. Uh, pretty conservative first 10 miles for those guys. 5.05 pace, but I like it. I, you know, I think the best way to run this course is with a slight negative split. I think just effort wise alone, it's probably about a one minute differential between that first and second half. So, leaving a, a little bit of time to grab is not a bad strategy. It's actually quite smart. You see Yano here, he has a PR of 212.28, said back in 2015 where he was 13th at the Berlin Marathon. You know,
right now he is on that pace to run 212. I think 212 has been a kind of a magic marker for a lot of athletes in the U.S. in marathoning, that you're either a, a 212 and up or you're a sub-212 runner out there. And this could be what's looking to shape up as a potential opportunity for Yano to establish himself as one of those sub-212 guys. Here's what's so important about today's race for Matt and a lot of these athletes is can I convince myself for the next year plus that I deserve to be on that Olympic team? If Matt comes out today, wins this race, runs 210, feels good about himself, then he has such an obvious intention to make that Olympic team. Not that he doesn't already, but he would be training with this idea that that Olympic team is mine. On the day, he won't need something heroic or something groundbreaking and new. Instead, he will have said, I've done this before, and I just need to have a good average day at the Olympic trials once again in order to make that team. And that's a huge mental advantage. And you can see now the pacing here of Samuel Kozgai, pretty even splits throughout. So, you know, the what that shows though a little bit is the gap between everybody else and continuing to move his way up. And pal, just back to the Matt Lano, Matt Yano, I'm gonna just keep going back and forth on that all day. Matt Yano conversation about his intent. You even talked about when you were chatting about your own training and racing and kind of come back from, from injury and such that, you know, so frequently being able to do it once means you can do it again. And getting that in, getting that 210, getting that 211, whatever that might be in here for Yano, is it going to do nothing but present him with sort of this position in his training knowing that he can do it yeah that's you know that's why he's not scared to go out the pace that he's going out because he's done it before and once you've done it a few times it's easier to do it again and again for a big breakthrough that first time you might need that perfect block of training you might need that perfect six month block in order to reach that new level. But once you've reached that level before, it's easier to get there again and again. You know, an analogy I always use is, I say fitness is like a balloon. Once you blow up a balloon that first time and get it to a size that it's never been, it's really tough. But if you let the air out and blow it up again, it's a little bit easier. And the more times you blow it up and let the air out, the easier and easier it gets. And that's fitness. And Yano continuing to move out here, just past the 11 mile mark. You saw his average mile splits up there a little bit before. Just kind of cruising along, 501s, 458s, 459s. He's pretty consistent in there with a couple undulations. Basically, we're talking about the same effort with no fall off through 11 miles. All right. And we've got Reyes there on the inside averaging things averaging things out just past the 11 mile mark so they're about you know i'd say about 30 seconds behind ish right now in the grand scheme of things that's not a lot with a couple people able to sit there and, and work on it it's always great to have teammates or at least not even necessarily teammates but just the folks that are out there you can all kind of run together, keep pushing together. Reyes is, uh, again, a 213 guy. He was the 2010 U.S. Marathon champion. He's been a marathoner for a long time. I'm confident that a guy like him knows a plan and is just trying to execute it. And our mystery 208 out there is actually Wilkerson Given of the Atlanta Track Club out here. It's a Furman University. He's kind of one of those guys that's, you know, a 404 miler in college and moved his way up and continuing to run better and better running for the Atlanta Track Club. A lot of athletes kind of moving down that direction. You know, I was actually tipped off by a friend that Wilkerson would be up in there in the hunt. He obviously knew something was going well in his training because 
he's running great right now. Uh, he's a 215-52 guy, so he's quite ahead of that pace. But he just ran 62.50 at Las Vegas, which is a pretty substantial indicator for him that lets him know I can't, a 62 minute half, especially probably in some decent miles and training, definitely says I can run 212. And some of the nuance elements of you know comparing a, a half marathon to a marathon, you know, the the change in threshold from that distance to the full, from the half distance to the full is actually it, it's so it can be so marginal in that you know changing of pace by 10 seconds per mile allows them to run 26 while just they can run you know 13 miles just 10 seconds per mile faster. So those those changes and differences are are so specific and small in how they race and how they train uh, it, it really in my mind kind of uh, kind of makes running somewhat of a science and it's so it's such a game of feel they know exactly what pace running without those GPS watches yeah and that's where energy consumption really comes in something a lot of these athletes will do in training which you know some will do others won't it's uh depends on your coach and your training system but is uh, the depletion run now, a depletion run, for those who may not be familiar, is essentially going into a long run or a workout purposely underfed. With uh, You'll maybe eat an early dinner the night before. You'll wake up in the morning and you won't take anything in except water. And so the idea being that you're teaching your body how to burn fat more efficiently. And so that way, on race day, in the later stages of the race, you're better at that point because of it an average elite marathoner might burn about 2,600 calories in a marathon like this. Now, you can only really store about 2,000 calories, so where are you gonna make up that gap? And that's where basically the ability to consume fat at a very efficient rate becomes so important. And it's a fun little nuance of training for the marathon that makes it a little bit different than on the track where mm -hmm. that's not an issue. And one thing I would say here, Kyle, and, and certainly chime in on this, Emma's form has not changed, not broken down, not altered even in the slightest. Yeah, it's almost robotic, which is certainly a compliment. She is fully programmed into this pace. She, again, has that little smirk on her face, and she looks confident as hell. And I'm really excited to see how things start to go now that we are an hour into race and she's going to start embarking on a distance that she hasn't fully experienced before. Emma's actually being coached by her fiance as we had mentioned earlier which in talking to her she said was you know a lot of people in her life kind of cautioned her about being coached by your significant other and through history we've seen plenty of really positive athlete coach relationships in which you know married couples are coaching one another and while warned about it by you know probably quite a few people she said that it's been incredible that no one knows her like Cameron knows her that he's almost the first person that can read her in a race and has always been that way since college. And so that's been a huge advantage for her, just having someone that she so fully trusts and sees, you know, more so than just at practice a couple days a week, but in everyday life. He knows if she is having a hectic day, if she didn't sleep well the night before and can program that into the training. And just passing mile 11 there, Bates still just kind of cruising along, looking pretty fantastic. We saw on the screen earlier that Megan Christian just now has a few steps on Sarah Crouch and Stephanie Ruff, uh, sorry, Stephanie Rustin Bruce, I guess, just uh, just behind her. And she looks great, uh, you know, that clearly starting to look up and maybe wondering where Emma is. And Emma, even ratcheting things down a little bit, kind of cruising more 
towards that 535 pace through 11 miles. So she's certainly running with a lot of confidence. Christian here, certainly not intimidated by the likes of Crouch and Bruce. In fact, perhaps taking advantage of the fact that those two have run major marathons in recent weeks. Yeah, I think that if I'm her, I want to push this middle section to do my best to break them, you know, where the, the freshness of perhaps an easy few weeks is starting to dissipate, and instead it's really just coming down to the amount of miles you've run recently and the, the fitness and maybe trying to cue a little bit of doubt in their minds of whether or not they can handle a pace like this. Um, again, we can't say it enough. There's so much race left and all it's gonna take is um, one bad mile for things to change. But Megan right now looks super composed. Yeah, and I think that one of the things we should point out, and I've had this conversation with a lot of folks that are either marathons on up, you know, in the ultra world, there will be inevitably a dark spot during, you will, you will go someplace dark at some point during this race. And I think that is making sure if, if, if Christian is feeling good through this middle section, just like you mentioned, Kyle, taking advantage of that and pushing that pace, because if she goes, if she goes dark later on and, and Bruce and, um, Crouch are able to put some miles on her or puts to put a gap on her right now She's taking advantage of the fact that she knows that those two are depleted a little bit more than she is Yeah, and I think such an important thing is knowing before the race even begins. Hey, there's gonna be a dark spot I'm going to hit one of those and you have to prepare. How am I going to respond? mentally when that happens because there's no way you're making it 26 miles without feeling crappy for a little bit and some familiar faces still surrounding Emma Bates. You see the run for the Campfire Relief jersey that she's wearing. If you are just joining us, she is unsponsored, so taking this opportunity to make a statement and do something positive while trying to earn both, uh, you know, some, some dollars for the relief fund, but also just generate some awareness for that relief fund as well and partnering with Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, their Resilience IPA that they just had a thousand, over a thousand different brewers help them produce and sell to raise money for the relief efforts down there from the Camp Fire in Northern California. So we saw photos from the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company during those fires that it looked like the, the it almost looked like their entire brewery was on you know, glowing. It was so close to those fires and they came through unscathed, but I know that a lot of their employees at Sierra Nevada lost homes as they many of them live in the neighboring town of Paradise that is basically no longer. That's just a, a, a very emotional thing for Emma and certainly a, um, a, a point of note just in our nation about the, our resiliency and efforts to make it through these natural disasters and, and it's with the efforts of individuals, the collective of individuals doing things like this benefit us all I think there is probably some doubts in these athletes mind a few weeks ago about whether or not the fires would affect the race would it be smoky would it be safe would it still go on and luckily we are here today and it appears that everything is running smoothly that the air quality was fine and good enough and you know there's some level of significance obviously that the race is starting at the Folsom Dam, but finishing in front of the state capitol. Uh, obviously, the the state capitol is gonna have to be quite busy and really go to work as the state of California bonds together over these tragedies. And Yano there in the bottom left of your screen still just kind of making his way through town. I think we see some glimmers of athletes though there in the background, so we might have a little bit of a gap being closed. I'm not entirely certain uh, yet. We'll get some metrics here coming up as they cross a few of the, the, the splits that we actually get data for. But right now, Yano's still looking very, very mechanical. Uh, I don't see any slowing yet. So the race has an overall elevation gain of 796 feet. 
which just for comparison new york which is often called a very hilly race is actually about eight hundred eighty feet of overall elevation gain so while people will and we will say it again again while this is a fast course there are hills and matt is now more or less making his way through the the biggest of them all they're long gradual climbs you don't really have to shorten your stride too much and put your head down to get to the top of them but they do pay quite a bit of a fee on the legs and it probably is a little bit of a relief a relief as you make it to that halfway point you've probably studied the elevation map quite a bit in your preparation and you know it's all downhill from here and With just looking at that profile it, i can see exactly what you're talking about kyle and that there's some a lot of undulation through these middle miles and once you are able to get toward the the high teens and actually looking at more like even a 20 mile mark it really is a consistently smooth downhill and here, here we go this is really just this is the that, chase pack so that's joe stillen on the right of your screen the princeton grad running for zap fitness and his teammate josh izuski right behind him they're a really fun little group of guys to be keeping an eye on for this race Joe, Josh, Matt McClintock, and Andrew Colley are four guys running for Zap Fitness who've been together for quite a few years, and all four of them doing this block together in preparation for their marathon debut. So their plan was to go out as a pack, kind of almost run it like a cross-country race, stick together and see what they can do. Um, I know all of them probably have their first and foremost goal being the Olympic trials qualifying time, but if they can see the finish line and see that that is secure, I wouldn't be shocked if they start taking some risks. And we see the times there populating the graphic. Those are all half marathon times, so we are definitively on the back half of this marathon with obviously Lano 105. And then a lot of folks in that higher 66 range that you just look at that pack here and then you see Ian Butler on the far left trying to separate himself a little bit. He might be ready to kind of make some moves if he's out there kind of pulling away from the rest of that pack. So speaking to a point earlier about the fact that the race would run in terms of even effort roughly a minute faster on the second half. We are setting up for some great times assuming that everyone is pacing themselves appropriately. 66.45 for that big pack right in the middle there. That's saying that these guys can very likely run 2.12. And you know it's warming up a little bit. See here on the God has ditched the skull cap. No longer need to keep that dome warm. And us some, some guys that have actually uh, had fallen back a little bit have made their way back in. You see Brendan Gregg, he's got the sunglasses in the kind of dead center of that pack. He showed a little bit of struggle early and has come back into it. So we've got a lot cooking here. Lano still, you know, heads and tails above the chase pack. But everybody else here looking pretty comfortably. And, and you know, there's definitely a value, it would seem, Kyle, to being in that chase pack, to being surrounded by everybody just getting sucked along. Yeah, as we were saying earlier, you can really just shut your mind off. Right now it seems like Joe Stillen is the one leading the charge. Uh, I've known Joe for a long time, full disclosure. Uh, it was a, a rival of mine back in college and then my roommate of mine while competing at the University of Texas. And Joe's a 358 miler and he's been stuck there for a while and we were on a run about a year ago when he, he kind of had the realization that he was going to have to move up to the marathon and in just discussing his training and seeing what he always really excelled at realizing that he's a guy who stays healthy and can just afford to work really really hard it just became pretty obvious of a move to just go to the marathon to start running those big miles in practice because he's a guy who can handle it he can recover from it and so now it's all you know this is what he's been aiming towards for a year and it's awesome to see him running so fearless and you can almost tell that if you would have asked me to evaluate the biomechanics taking still in versus many of the others the foot strike tells me that he's a miler or at least a mid d guy on the track yeah, he's a, a former miler, I guess. Former, he's <laughs> it's 
put some miles on those legs. You know, it's got to be a very, pretty interesting study to look at the change in the, the VO2 max, just the engine of an athlete going from something that a race took them four minutes and now it takes them, you know, over two hours. Yeah, you know, hopefully at this point in their career, though, they've run so many long runs that are two plus hours long. Um, I know Coach Pete Rea at Zap Fitness is a big fan of making those long runs into workouts, uh, oftentimes mixing the fartlet component. They will go out for a 20 plus mile long run, but be dropping off one, two, three, four minute segment pushes all along the way. So those athletes, especially if this turns into a real race with some surging, I would expect them to be able to respond quite confidently. It's something that they have trained for. They are not just running five minute pace all day long. They are able to change paces as well. And that's a benefit coming from the track. Yeah, absolutely. And, and looking here, Emma Bates taking more fluid as these elites actually get their own tables with, where they get to place their own bottles, just making sure they're labeled nicely and correctly so they can easily find them. But you see there's splits now through 20K. Running very well, so just the 1730s kind of clicking off pretty well for Bates. Christian putting a little bit of space in there now. 1744 versus 1748 back to Bruce and Crouch, so it's still about a four second lead for her, which might be even closing now a little bit as those t other two women are well in sight. The TV angle can always really mess with your perspective. At, at points, you'll think someone is right on top of another, and then all of a sudden you'll pan to the side and you'll realize that there's quite a little bit of daylight between them. But in this position right here, it looks like Steph and Sarah are fully aware of Megan and are going to work probably slowly to reel her back in. Now again, just to point out, uh, if you didn't join us at the top of the show, we looked at the point standings and the prize money standings for the U.S. road running racing circuit, and it really looked like Stephanie Bruce, should she actually win this, could actually take control of the U.S. running circuit now. The other plus opponent there, is like Emma me. Bates, would have to finish out seven. Just to ultimately win that, but anything is possible. But right now, looking at Emma Bates, just keeps moving up and clicking off and dropping some of those male contestants there and looking for the next person to chase and the next person to follow here as she is looking pretty fantastic through the half marathon. You see her split there at 113.24 through half marathon, just to kind of give you a sense of what she's clicking off now. These roughly at two on, well, frankly, 226 and some change pace. So really picking things up from that 540 down to that 535 pace. So could be a very interesting outcome here in her debut marathon as Emma Bates really setting herself up for quite a crispy fast time with Kripchen and Crouch and Bruce, you know, ready to run those 228s. That seems to be kind of like where they feel most comfortable between 228 and 230, but in Kripchen there, see getting absorbed now by Crouch and Bruce, but Bates, 113.24, looking right there at about a 226 high to 227 marathon debut, which would be pretty fantastic. I think that one thing in American distance running right now is we have a skewed perspective of what our marathoners are capable of because so many of them choose to do the marathon majors because New York is tough. Boston, if the weather doesn't cooperate, can really be rough like it is this year. So when we're seeing some of the fastest times of the year, it's not necessarily telling the whole story. It's not necessarily fair to speak to the depth of American distance running by just saying how many guys have broken 212 this year or how many women have broken 230. Because you see, as soon as we get everyone out on a good day on a nice course like this, they're running really fast. And this is not to take anything away from these women, but you know, Shalane Flanagan isn't here, Molly Huddle isn't here, Amy isn't here. And so 
the depth of American distance running when we're seeing this many girls on sub 230 pace without you know our Olympic team present 2020 is going to be a serious battle and I think if you make that team you're thinking I'm capable of meddling yeah, and you can see the paces here that these ladies are all running a little bit of difference in average pace for each segment each 5k segment out there between Christian Bruce and Crouch but at the end of the day they're now all together so the average pacing before however nuanced is not going to play into a huge difference in how they perform up to this point now Kyle talking about the Olympic trials I mean this is obviously one of the main races that so many people come to to try to get that trials qualifier and that trials time has crept faster and faster as years have gone by where you know, it used to be on the men's side, you know, all you had to do was run 222, 221 to get into the Olympic trials for the marathon. And now it's in that 215, 216 range that you're going to have to see people down in there. Yeah, so the the standards this year in order, or this cycle in order to qualify is 219 and 245. And by, it's a delicate balance for USATF to find the right time because you want to have a realistic enough time that you're really filling a field. It's a marathon. You can afford to have a lot of people in it, but you're also pushing excellence by dropping that time down. By having a standard like 219, people are going to go out and try and run under 219, whereas maybe if the time was 222, people aren't going to necessarily take the chances. They're not going to train for the 217 that they're capable of because it's not necessary in order to achieve their dream of running for the Olympic trials. Now, right now, Emma certainly looking to be a contender of some kind. Now, granted, as you mentioned, we don't have the likes of Huddle, Linden, uh, Hall even in this case, Flanagan, Amy Craig, there's a, a realization with all of those athletes that they're also getting older. Emma is on the younger end of that spectrum and might be the future of this particular event. Yeah, a lot can change in a four-year cycle. Um, what seems like an obvious qualification for people a few years ago, all it takes is one mistimed injury, a few years older, and the ascent of a younger runner into a new stratosphere of running and all of a sudden that's how you get a brand new Olympic team that's how you get people to basically be the new face of American distance running and maybe today we are watching Emma start to reach that whole new level that she believes she's capable of and also Matt Lano down here in the bottom left of your screen trying to give you as much coverage as possible of both race leaders now Matt Lano still just pulling away we have no sight of anybody in the background doing incredibly well still clicking off here's your 25k splits 117 20 through 25 kilometers so racing incredibly fast we seem to keep finding him but right when he's taking nutrition so we know he's consistent on getting in the calories and getting hydrated Definitely a little easier when you're all alone. You can maneuver your way over to the table and find your bottle without having to dodge the traffic of other runners. And we've seen it in the past where different people are moving in and out of there and other bottles get knocked over and, and all that. But in, in the field here, someone to kind of, t uh, you know, a point of note, I should say, Marty Hay here, 119.08. Now he's in the middle of this chase pack but certainly somebody who could continue moving up should he uh, really dive into it. Yeah, so this is his debut. So my guess is he wants to run it conservatively. A big thing is you want to come out and have a good, positive first marathon experience. You don't want to leave doubting your place as a marathoner. You want to say, I could have run faster had I taken some more chances, and I'll do that next time. And I think that's what Marty's doing. But Marty is someone who I'm going to keep an eye on as the race starts to unfold and once he knows that he has that time safe now Marty's interesting because he out of Syri he graduated from Syracuse and was seventh at the Olympic trials marathon uh, sorry at the Olympic trials 10k he joined NAZ elite out in Flagstaff and he did really well there but he left to pursue 
a degree in medicine, and he's currently enrolled at the Thomas, at Thomas Jefferson University and is fully taking classes, is on his way to becoming a doctor, yet is still finding a way to run and is continuing to really improve. And now he is with the Reebok Boston Track Club, which is based in Charlottesville, Virginia, but he is training alone in Philly and getting it done. Now, for some of you watching, you know, obviously we're gonna see, you see Matt Lano's splits here pretty incredible and consistent throughout all of these. But talking back about the, uh, the notion of going to medical school and training for the marathon, and we've, we've seen this one the other time. There's a, a, a generational thing here, so for some of you watching, you may know exactly what I'm talking about. But Bob Kempinen was in full-time medical school when he made the Olympic team back in 1992, I believe, uh, in training and formerly raced at Dartmouth, if I'm not mistaken, and was going to medical school was America's best marathoner at the time and, and uh, managed to figure it out, whether it's cold, dark mornings, treadmills, lots of solo running out there, but it's certainly doable. Yeah, and while I don't remember this, I do know it was 96 because I looked it up. There it is, 96. Well, you know, you get to be my age and all the things start to blur together. 92, 96, at this point 2000, I don't even know. That seems forever ago. And Marty is actually a father now. He has a six month at home, McKenna, who perhaps is watching and cheering for daddy. Uh, but yeah, I, I know uh, Marty have raced him for a long time. I remember from his recruiting trip in college a long, long time ago. But uh, he's been using the treadmill as one of his best friends. Uh, it definitely becomes key, so that way he can be babysitting and also running at all hours of the day and night in order to get his 105 miles a week in. But yeah, it's someone that I'm going to continue to keep an eye on as we hit those final miles. And, you know, he's a sub four minute miler, a little bit of a downhill and some fresh legs. Who knows what he can do? Yeah, but at this point right now, Matt Yano, clearly the class of the field and not letting anybody even remotely come close to catching him. So we're trying to give you some anecdotal information about some others in the chase pack as the gap here it just continues to rise you see emma bates there in your top right of screen kind of locking into this other athlete which is totally great uh, probably nice to give herself a bit of a mental break we talked about that you you want to be able to fall asleep for some time during that marathon and hopefully it's not when the going gets tough because that's when you're going to let kind of the, the miles slip away or the time slip away from you but right now it's still looking very mechanical, not breaking down. I don't see any sense of of any uh, fatigue is the word I was looking for there. And on the bottom left of the screen, you see Steph Bruce, Sarah Crouch. I don't know if that means we've lost Megan Christian or if she's up ahead. I suspect that she has fallen back just a little bit. And there she is. Christian putting in a great effort, but you know, there's a certain amount of experience sort of the stalwart nature of Steph Bruce and Sarah Crouch. They are the class of the field in terms of being around. They've done this a lot. They've run a lot of marathons, and they're not afraid of a little give and go during the, during the race. Sarah is, you know, she's been doing this a long time, and naturally, when you've been running for a long time, you're going to have a few down years. And for her, she actually went four years without setting a personal best, which just mentally becomes a real drain on you. And you, you naturally are going to start to question, why am I doing this or my best year is behind me? But she is now running for Steve Magnus, who's coaching her mostly remotely, actually. Uh, her husband, Michael's a great runner himself. And so I think that having him around to help is probably a huge asset. But it wasn't until June she ran 71.31 at Grandma's Half Marathon that really just probably reinvigorated her, brought her back a little bit from the dead and said, hey, I'm not done. I've got a lot of running left in me. I'm certainly capable of more. So top right there is your leader, Emma Bates. Bottom left, your chase pack. That's second and third, Steph Bruce and Sarah Crouch. As Kyle just alluding to, Steve Magnus coaching Crouch. Magnus, a very science-based trainer. He uh, 
done a lot of research, has worked with a lot of athletes, and can probably explain the nuances of every molecular element of training. Yeah, uh, you know, Steve, I've been familiar with Steve for a long time, all the way back to my die stat days on the internet, and it was something that you and I were speaking briefly of yesterday about the internet's impact on training and how people like Steve putting out their workouts and information for the general public to be able to consume and just learn what are the top athletes doing? What is, What are they doing differently that has propelled them to such a high level? And ultimately, not that there were any secrets, but now there are certainly no secrets. Uh, people are sharing that information pretty freely. And because of that, everyone is getting faster and faster because we're able to try what's working. And, you know, aptly said there, Kyle, and, and timing wise, um, super interesting in celebrating the 20 year anniversary of the Chris Lear's Running with the Buffaloes book that was really the first foyer into the rest of us learning what a top program fundamentally did as a culture, as a as training regiment, sort of as attitudes. And we got to see a lot of that in that Running with the Buffaloes book. And that is a precursor to all the things that we glean now from athletes because they the information age is upon us and we have access to everything and the amount of parity across collegiate programs and therefore um, individuals throughout the United States and beyond is, is incredible. Like we're seeing it, you don't just have to be running fast or you know, go, move to Palo Alto or Little Rock or Eugene to run fast, but you can do it a lot of places because it's not a secret anymore. Yeah, and when you are basically learning what others are doing you're pushing the boundaries of what's possible and it's basically back to that story of Roger Bannister breaking four minutes for the first time and everyone else suddenly realizing oh wait we can run that fast and from a training perspective it's the realization that we can all work harder that we can run more miles that we can run them faster and we can do harder and harder workouts and someone breaking down that barrier for you is a huge advantage. So with the internet age comes better training and faster athletes. I mean, I think it's that there, you could parallel the state of running in the United States and the quality and depth of field across distance running with the rise of information. I really believe that if you, if you tracked that, it would be a parallel. Yeah, you see it most obviously on the high school level. What uh, the times that I was running in high school versus what you were running in high school and the appropriate schools recruiting you, it's like you just, every hearing how fast kids are running today, it seems like every year there's another athlete in high school is capable of breaking four minutes for the mile. And it's just that access to information. It's no longer did I have that one top coach who knew what he was doing because Ultimately, anyone can know what they're doing now if they're willing to do enough research. And thank you for pointing out that what I was running in high school is probably a lot slower now than what you were running in yeah, high sorry. school. <laughs> so this pack is seems to be growing. Uh, Joe Stillen still at the front. Marty Ayer there on the right side in the neon green top. They're rolling though. They're you know sometimes in a race like this, you maybe think guys are looking around at each other, wondering, are you gonna go, am I gonna go? But Joe, showing no fear, is uh, dragging everyone along with him. We are fourth place in a fourth place pack. So we're looking at fourth place and up as part of this group right here which means we've got probably Reyes and Given out there in the gap. So if we hopefully we'll get some coverage of those guys, but still probably moving along. It's We, we can't see them from here. We can't see them from the front. So there's uh, clearly a nice gap of those guys running in a little bit of a no man's land, but hopefully it's part of this sort of just the training and sort of self-awareness that those guys can still do it on their own. Yeah, the question is, can this pack see them? Do they know uh, that Wilkerson is up there? Do they know just how far in front Matt is? Because, you know, we're, we still got 
a good 40 plus minute or about 40 minutes of running left. And so you have to start thinking long term now. You're you're more or less I would say this group given unless they don't really blow up is more or less safe on the Olympic trials qualifying time. And so you can take your chance now. You can start to think a little bit bigger. And Lano there at the bottom left. Definitively your leader, you know, through about 14 miles, I believe. We're on just a little bit over 2.11 pace. So definitely trying to get out there to see if he can best that PR of his and be one of those sub 2.12 guys. So the water stations are once every two miles or so in the beginning, but as the, the race moves on, it becomes more and more frequent. Right now it's about once every one and a half miles, and then after 19 miles, there will be a water station every mile. And so they're continuing to have their opportunities to take their bottles. Emma there has hers. She found it no problem, and this is the point in the race where you might even consider start to take some caffeine. Um, somewhere right in that a little over halfway you might start uh, mixing in 50 milligrams of caffeine you might pop a run gum but you need that little extra boost uh, especially if you're Matt and Emma you're running alone for a while maybe you're getting a little bored you need to wake me up an hour and a half in here to the race Emma still looking very good comfortable confident taking her time with the hydration I think like you mentioned earlier Kyle that not everybody has the iron gut, and you might not be able to just slam the fluids and slam the gels or whatever kind of carbohydrates you're taking and caffeines. But you might just have to kind of pace that out over a little bit of time. Yeah, and you want to be careful because I'm sure that if you're chugging the water too quickly, you're going to get that sloshy feeling. Most of these athletes probably ate a pretty light breakfast. Uh, the majority of them probably woke up sometime between 4 and 5 a.m. this morning in order to get their peanut butter and toast and banana down, everyone having their own perfect formula, many probably involving oatmeal. But you're not, you don't have a ton of food in there. A lot of your calories are coming through liquid. And so to avoid that feeling of sloshy stomach water, you, you gotta be careful, take your time and don't rush it. And from a nutrition perspective, water by itself is never really gonna cut it. You gotta have the sodiums and sugars in there to help with absorption. So they, everybody's got their own tailored, very likely tailored solution. And they know exactly what they're taking in and whether it's a high fat content or high sugar content, whatever works for them, everybody's solution is always a little bit different. It's very rare that you'll find these guys with a stock off the shelf type of hydration solution. And uh, Wilkerson given here, kind of putting some distance on some things here. He, you know, running by himself, it's a lot to ask, where he probably can barely see, if at all, Matt Yano, uh, probably about a minute up on him. Yeah, you hope he has some family and friends out there, a coach who's maybe finding him later in the race and just giving him some indication of where he's at. Just, you know, knowing that he's just a, a little bit back is enough to motivate you to keep going or to know that the group behind you is comfortably behind you or maybe they're closing, that those little cues can really make a difference mentally. Dan, our split time's there through 30K. You see the last five kilometers is the split. And actually, it doesn't look like Given got registered in there. And maybe it has something to do with the fact that he, maybe he lost his bib because he, uh, has a random number 208 on his chest. Maybe that's his goal. <laughs> he just took a Sharpie and drew in a colon there between the two and the and the zero. So we passed 19 miles just there. So it's just seven to go. He's, you know, just trying to, you gotta stay composed at this point. Just once you can visualize the finish, once you can really taste it, it, takes quite the burden off, but the wall is definitely a threat at all points once you're this late in the race. 
So just to kind of give some context to the pace these guys are running, I think you've been right all along, Kyle, and that Yano is starting to pick things up a little bit, as are the other athletes, but he's now kind of approaching that sub five minute pacing. And that's, uh, you know, he, he's, he was 501 the first 5K, 459s, 458s, you know, so, they, and, they, and there we go, through 30K, five flat. This is all, the consistency factor here is impressive as much as anything else. Yeah, he is a metronome for sure. And for Matt, this would be such a big deal for him to come out and run a personal best, especially in this way. He's an athlete who has had a few pretty major injuries in his career, especially recently. Um, a couple of years ago, he had some core muscle surgery, unfortunately at the Vincere Institute in Philadelphia, something that's a little too familiar to me because <laughs> I had the same surgeon work on me recently. But so he had that to deal with, and then in New York, he tore his labrum. And so this is definitely a story of redemption for him to be able to solo, essentially, almost 20 miles of this race at sub five minute pace. And I know personally I'm rooting for him to hold on for a big personal best. And another person to root for here is Sergio Reyes, doing everything he can to close that gap, also running by himself. No stranger to this event, not necessarily this course, but the 2010 champ, U.S. Marathon champion back in 2010. So, you know, we are talking eight years later, but the marathoner is an, is an older gentleman's game, it seems like. The, the older and stronger oftentimes people get with doing these things over and over and over. He is. He's not afraid of this race. He's clearly ready to go out there and get after it. He wasn't willing to sit back and just let the pack, not dilly-dally, but they weren't being aggressive enough for him. And he may have just waited a little bit too long to make his move out to try to reel in Matt Yano. Now granted, we do have about 30 minutes of racing to go, maybe a little over 30 minutes, which is actually quite a bit of time, but Right now, Yano not showing any signs of fatigue. I know a big focus for Matt, as I was saying earlier, is no longer worrying about the miles. For him, he says, the focus is all on quality now, that there's no such thing as an easy long run for him. It's just about how fast are you going on your major workouts and he's tired of having a 212 PR. He said that he is just one of many 212 28 guys, uh, supposedly Matt Tegenkamp, Danny Tapia, who's in this race, Scott Bobble, Tyler McCandles. There's all these Americans who've run 212 28, and I think he's trying to separate himself a little bit from the pack. And last year, Tyler McCandles was actually running that 212 is a testament to the kind of course this is. On any other course, it's not quite that, has not traditionally been the quite that caliber, but came here to a race like this and able to knock out a 212 marathon and put a, that feather in his cap as one of those preeminent marathoners in the US. And Matt Yano right now really showing that he wants to be the class of this field and wants to be taken seriously when it comes to the next Olympic trials. He's probably feeling quite at home with all the cyclists around him. Uh, supposedly, he does all of his workouts more or less alone, but he just has Ryan Hall, the former runner and now bodybuilder, <laughs> as his coach who bikes alongside him and paces him with workouts, giving him fluids and whatnot. So uh, it's probably a little level, level of comfort to see a guy just riding along with him. Through mile 18 now for Emma Bates at 141, roughly, is about when she crossed that threshold. So 141, about 227 high pace right in there. So uh, still very impressive, pretty consistent, and doing it the hard way. additionally impressive here Kyle is that she hasn't let any of the other men running around here that have you know 
ebbed and flowed in their particular race plans. She hasn't gone with or let them, you know, drag her up or down either direction. She has really stayed true to her pace and her race plan. Yeah, she's just in the zone. She's locked in. Seems to have found that zen-like state is, that is so necessary to really succeed in the marathon. Uh, she's dialed in and nothing is distracting her. I think as we watch all these athletes come through this 18, 19, and 20 mile marks, and our second placer right now, just really kind of coming out of nowhere, making some big moves in passing both Steph Bruce and Sarah Crouch. This is lining up to be a big race for Sam Roker, the Providence grad out of Section 2, New York. And she uh, she ran 238, I believe, at the Hartford Marathon to win. And so she just keeps getting better and better. She had a big breakthrough in New York uh, a few years ago. And she's just, she was a great runner in high school, running for Burnt Hills, succeeded in college, had some great seasons there, but is really just finding her niche as she's getting older and moving up. And marathon seems to be coming really, really comfortable for her. Just another one of those athletes that really focused on the middle distances, especially being a high school 1500 meter runner. Moving up though to the fives, the tens, now doing a lot of what she loves, and that is pounding the pavement in a lot of these longer races, 15Ks, half marathons, marathons. and really not having any fear. I mean, the lining up, Kyle, you and I have talked about this. When you line up against people that have run faster, that may have been, you know, you have the sort of generational age differences sometimes, and you can look up to somebody. Like, you may have had their poster on your wall at some point, and finally it's, some, and, you know, you get good enough that you're racing them. And I'm not necessarily saying that Sam Rooker has, you know, posters of Steph Bruce, but, but the fact that Steph has been at the top of her game for quite some time, but not having the fear not being intimidated by anybody and just going out there and giving it her best and sitting here now in second place, another young runner relative to the marathon world. Yeah, and the gloves have come off. Um, you know, she's, she's starting to get into that final mindset. It's a, it's a long, drawn-out final 10K or so. But at this point, you know, it's probably a few degrees warmer than it was at the start. Um, certainly, the body temperature has come up quite a bit at this point and so you just for her it's about focusing not looking back at this point you're only looking ahead you're just trying to see the finish line you just want to see it know that you're it's it's very encouraging to know that you're about to have a major breakthrough you're in the midst of it one of the interesting things about the marathon to Kyle and we're looking here at Matt Yano still continuing to roll is that you may feel good, and I'm, tell I'm telling you this from my experience, not running competitive marathons, but just running marathons, in that when you are out there, you may feel unbelievable at mile 18 and decide to start throwing down some faster miles because you start thinking you're much more close to the finish line than you actually are. And then mile 22 or 23 will pop up and just bite you. So it would be really interesting to see what some of these moves here in these later teen miles are gonna do as it, as it relates to their ability to finish and close hard. Yeah, in these later miles, it's almost not about even how fast can you go, but how slow can you not go? Can you avoid those 530 plus miles? Uh, just stay, even if that means having to dial it back a tiny bit in these miles uh, 2021, just so you can survive, that's okay. It's just as long as you don't all of a sudden start crawling into the it's like he who decelerates least might be the one to win. Like an 800. <laughs> I think you've heard that from gags before. Yeah. You get one move in the eight, and you really get one move in the marathon. At this point, a lot of these athletes have probably made their move. 
and at least uh, some of these guys up front. I think Matt Lano made Matt Yano, sorry, made his move uh, in that second mile, and he's just been rolling since. Um, I love that he hasn't looked back once. And you know else who hasn't looked back at all is indeed Emma Bates. Such composure for her first marathon. Now, of course, she's been out there and she's done her 20 milers, maybe even 22 milers. Um, so she, this is not foreign to her, but race pace is a different beast. Having a great race now in about fifth place is Mick Icofano. Sorry if uh, I mispronounced that last name, but he's a 218 guy, he ran collegiately at Kentucky. His PR is from last year, but he is fully in it right now. He came through 30K in 135.0. Uh, he, his last 5K was under 16 minutes, which puts him right in with the rest of that pack. He's just sitting right in there. So this is setting up to be a pretty significant breakthrough for him. And through 30K, I know we've kind of talked about that a little bit. Obviously, Yano up front, Reyes sitting in second, having overtaken Wilkerson Given. Um, Given still there sitting in third. And then it's back to the rest of that pack, which is still it. Ayakofano, Azuski, McDonald, LeBlanc, Brogan Austin, Malcolm Richards, Kyle Masterson, Brendan Gregg, the list goes on and on. Tony G Costales, Samuel Cosguy, Martin Hayher, Ian Butler. I mean, that group is insanely huge. William Reyes also in there. You know, just the, then there's a slight gap back to it, a whole boatload of other guys. So that, that chase pack is immense. So you got Joe Stillen still up there, Marty Ayers up there, and there's Mick Icofno. Josh Izuski is right behind him, sitting in on his teammate. And these guys look really good. They certainly have a lot of life in their legs left. A lot of confidence comes with running next to other people who are feeling good. Uh, you get those good vibes, really bouncing off on each other and know that you're all having a day. And I think there's another point when you're looking at these races, you can tell who's feeling good because they're willing to run three abreast rather than tucking in in a pace line. Yeah, you're not just staring down at someone's back and just hoping to tie on and just get dragged. You're willing to look up at the road, see how long you have to go and not be scared to push towards it. And again, there's two athletes between this pack and our leader, Yano, and that is Sergio Reyes and Wilkerson Given, Given being the, the, the taller of the two in the red Atlanta Track Club kit, and then Sergio Reyes is wearing the hat. The Nike kit, so I think, or not Nike kit, I think it was a, uh, Hoka. a Hoka kit, excuse me. Similar coloring. Um, nevertheless, we'll do what we can to get you visuals on them. At least we'll continue to update you on their splits. But Marty Hay here, here in the, the neon green of the new Reebok group formed out there with Chris Fox, former Syracuse coach and former coach of Hay here in college. Coaching a number of athletes as Reebok now again getting into the game. Yeah, it's good to see companies welcoming uh, themselves back into the running game. The, the more involved, the better. They've just been one that's been in and out a lot over the last 20 years, just different priorities in their sports marketing efforts. But nevertheless, we've got an amazing group, talent, just incredibly talented group of young athletes now under the tutelage of Chris Fox in you know, that Boston area. You see across the sport more and more groups developing. Uh, the, the athlete training by themselves day in and day out, um, of shoe companies sponsoring individual athletes and saying live wherever you like, those days are slowly disappearing. And the Reebok Enclave group was actually one of the first groups that really started this trend in American distance running and I believe helped propel the entire sport in the US to where it is today. Born out of that, you saw lots of groups start to arise out of the Enclave, which include 
the Aggies out in California, the farm team out in California. You started seeing teams like Zap Fitness emerge and, and other groups where it was really more about the collective efforts and not about the individuals. You know, I think from a training perspective, it's the accountability, it's the ability to push each other. But then I think of it from the brand perspective of you're getting more out of your investment in athletes when they're branded and lumped together. Uh, people really like getting behind the entire team. It's it's more exciting to root for the entire New York Yankees rather than just one fantasy player. So you root for the Yankees, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's cool if you're into it. That's fine. So Matt now still just looking great. Um, a reminder that the 26.2 distance converted into kilometers for those of you who don't have your calculators at home is uh, basically 42K. So when you're seeing that 5K split, you're seeing uh, that we're getting pretty close. And Yano's split time, 16.08, would indicate that he might be fatiguing a little bit. That is his slowest 5K split of the day so far. We've also seen, you know, a, a little bit of a hilly section in here. It's not too bad, but it's the kind of stuff that can start to zing you as you're hitting those 20 mile markers out there and beyond. Yeah, the question is, is a minute gap enough at this point? And, you know, he really has about two minutes back to that big pack. You know, so you have a few seconds of wiggle room, um, you know, running up a hill a little bit more conservative, conservatively at this point, just to make sure that your surviving is not necessarily a bad thing. The question is, again, was it a strategic slowdown or was it a fatigue issue? And you gotta think that when you're running by yourself, Kyle, that sometimes you don't know how badly you're fatiguing because the effort is perceivably the same, but you have no other gauge outside of your watch telling you whether you traditionally you know, like fundamentally slow down or not. You can see Reyes here at the top right and now center of screen just also clicking along. He's, uh, his splits are continuing to improve. Now, I would say uh, I'm what I'm seeing, Kyle, and correct me if, if you have a different kind of perspective on this, that the waving of the head back and forth is a little bit more than we've seen in the past. And I know we're talking about really nitpicking kind of the fatigue factors here, but the body and cadence and carriage of your of your torso and arm swing and head bobbing and all that kind of stuff are all the indicators of how we're doing. Yeah, every athlete has their first thing that will go on them. For some, it might be a little head wiggle. For others, the arms might stop coming across the body quite as much or their legs might start to dip a certain way. And so it's, it's probably the sort of thing that his coach might recognize first and hopefully tell him to, if he's out there, keep in check um, but yeah he has a little bit of a head wiggle going but I don't think it's any sort of breakdown as you can see his pacing is just still perfect um, 504 for that last bit it's consistent yeah the, the metronomic is that a word Met the metronomic way that he is clicking off those mile splits is actually incredibly impressive it's like he knew this is probably a prime example he knew what his threshold was today and it's 504 yeah, well, you know, that's the advantage of having done this marathon buildup so many times is he's run the same workouts, run the same course, and he's comparing them and knowing I've done X, so I am capable of Y. And Emma Bates up there in your top right, still just crushing along here. I would say finally probably getting to this point in the race where she's probably wondering what the heck she's doing out here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Heck of a long race, but has put such a gap on the field. I'm sure she's wondering where is everyone, because she's uh, almost got a two two minute gap on the field. Um, and you know, I, I know that she came in really confidently. I know she was feeling really strong, but again, don't want to celebrate too early. But this seems like it was relatively going perfectly to plan. And as a reminder, again, with a win here today, Emma will overtake Sarah Hall in the standings of the U.S. 
racing circuit, which is an, a nice little payout for Emma should she take the win today from the not only the race win, but the U.S. championship win, and being the U.S. road racing circuit champ. So a lot of these athletes are being coached remotely by people that aren't necessarily seeing them day in and day out. Rob, do you think there's an advantage or a disadvantage there? Does it work for certain personalities maybe better than others? Well, I think so. And, and we're, we're switching roles here in, in, in that I, you know, my experience was a group held me accountable. The individuals out there who are incredibly driven in this regard, and, and maybe not in a, not in an environment that uh, has has tons of other people around them, that they have to be really mentally disciplined. And I think it can work. I think it absolutely can. I think the one shortfall that you have is that ability to be around an athlete uh, uh, long enough and often enough to recognize, you know, the the body language and other things during a workout. Um, you're relying on the feedback of the athlete to kind of recognize how they're doing and how they're feeling versus being able to see what they're looking like uh, and being able to adjust workouts accordingly. But, you know, it's certainly a model that can work for a lot of people. I think one benefit when you're training alone or remotely is that there's a, you're more likely to do what feels right. You're not getting dragged along on recovery days at paces that are maybe a little bit quicker than you necessarily need in order to recover when you're working remotely or you know you're the only one out there on the track you can also move workouts around a little bit more that fit with your schedule and how your body is feeling you can wake up in the morning say you know things aren't feeling good i think the things would go a lot better if i were to push this back until tomorrow and sort of have that freedom to make that adjustment whereas if you're meeting a group of five other athletes for a workout you don't necessarily have that same ability so the wind is uh one meter per second so this will be a wind legal marathon <laughs> but really those stats are pretty great you know looking at the the cooler temps for the start to warming up just a little bit as you and I chatted a little bit last night Kyle that you know that the idea of getting over 50 degrees in a marathon starts to feel pretty hot so the more we keep it in this 30s and 40s the better off the athletes are and they'll warm up they'll feel good it'll just feel like a nice fall run for them out there Now, Emma's primary training partner has been Canadian Kinsey Middleton, who just raced in Toronto in October and won the Canadian Championships in 232.09. So it seems to be quite a good relationship blossoming there in Idaho, the two of them working really well together. Um, Emma noted that she was an incredibly positive person to work out with, which is a big deal being surrounded by someone who's constantly looking for the best in everything. That optimistic feel in the middle of a marathon grind can really keep you mentally stable during some of the low points that I'm sure exist when clicking off as many miles as they are. You see the prize money there for the USATF total prize purse. 20K win out here, determined by gun time, like the note there. Uh, the, although they did, I believe, all start at the front of the uh, front of the, the paddock. But nevertheless, 20K for the win out there. That's a fantastic payday, even a sixth place finish. And then the overall running circuit again, you win another 20K. So Emma, Emma Bates 
could be looking at potential 40K payout on a day like today with 20K for the win of this championship and another 20K for winning the, the road racing circuit. You see Sarah Hall with her cumulative winnings and her points. Now Emma Bates with a win here today would surpass Sarah Hall on that standing, taking home the final prize purse from the US road racing circuit, or running circuit, excuse me. I think we told you about a scenario where on the women's side, if Steph Bruce had won this race and Emma Bates finished outside the top seven, that Bruce would actually move into that winning position in the road racing circuit by half a point. But that does not appear to be a likelihood at this point. See the men's Lenny Career locked this up. He's not in the race today, but he locked up the running circuit win. Nice little take on the year from the prize purses uh, available at a number of different races. The people in the race today, you see the, the, the yellow uh, bullets there for Heron Legat, Marty Hay here, and some others in contention, but never going to work into that first place position in the running circuit. Matt's doing a great job of running the tangents and the benefit of being completely on his own right now is that he chooses the line and finds the way to not run a single set more than 26.2 miles if at all possible. And I think to, a, a point of note for those watching at home, when they measure out these courses, the course is measured 26.2 miles of tangents. They don't measure down the middle of the street. To be a certified course, they measure the shortest distance you could possibly run at any point. You could be weaving across streets, taking corners tight, whatever. That's how it's measured. So it's imperative that these athletes actually take those tangents, Kyle, if they want to run, officially run that 26.2, or at least their most, uh, the most efficient way possible. Five K split out there for Emma. Still moving along quite well. Getting the look from all these guys that she's passing. She's doing so. I, I, you know, Kyle. I think something that I've experienced, and again, not at the competitive level, but just being out there for this long. If you can start passing people with six miles to go, or in that sort of 18 to 20 some odd mile markers. You can't help but start to feel good. It gives you that ability to find the next victim, find the next roadkill that you can kind of keep picking off. And you can shift your brain and entire mentality around. Like you may feel like crap at this point, but you can start having small victories here and there. Yeah, you just need to almost lasso in the person in front of you, try and drag yourself up to them. And I think on the men's side, that's so important right now for that big pack of guys that we saw um, from fourth place back. I'm sure they're looking for Wilkerson to give in right now and just trying to, if you can eye him on the road and just find your way up towards him, it's a really big point of motivation. And eventually if they're, you know, really starting to roll, Sergio Reyes might come back to them, although he shows no signs necessarily yet of slowing down. And you saw uh, Steph Bruce there looking actually pretty spry. I think that very likely she's been instructed by her coach to get after it and try to close that gap but Emma right now certainly has a considerable lead. You can might even recognize some of the male athletes that Emma had been running with at some point. Now Steph, she Emma has left them, and Steph is catching them as we speak. So Steph's got a lot of ground to make up, but she is the veteran out here. She knows what this feels like. She knows what she's capable of, so you can't really put anything past her. is right around the 25 mile mark. I believe he would have just passed it. And at this point, I'm not gonna say he has it locked up, but now we're, we're fighting for those final seconds for that prettier, prettier PR that hopefully he has earned himself here today. You see a little bit of a grimace. There's the 25 mile marker right there, Kyle, as, as Yano has moved past that, now is into this final mile. So remember it's 
26.2, so it's nearly an extra quarter mile past that 26. So we'll, we'll wait and see kind of how this time pans out, but it could be in that 212s-ish. Yeah, so he must have had a couple slower miles there, and so now it's gonna be close. It's gonna be a sprint to the finish to see if he can dip under that 212, 28 PR from a few years ago. Either way, winning a marathon in such a dominant fashion will be reason enough to throw your hands up. I mean, basically, he just went out here and did a time trail all on his own, having led from the gun. Matt Yano looking to become the 2018 U.S. Marathon champion and the victor here on the course of Cal International Marathon. Having a great race now in second place is Brogan Austin. Uh, he was a, he's absolutely rolling. He just split a 15.08, which in perspective to Matt is, you know, a minute 20 or so faster. He's a, only run 224, but in November he did run 62.39 to win the monumental half in Indianapolis. So he is running hot right now. Uh, I think that unfortunately he may run out of real estate, but it is something to keep perspective as you can see him quite a little bit behind working his way up. He can see the finish line most likely and probably see Matt standing in his way between them and that point there. Now, a 15.08 split, probably being the, his fastest 5K split on the day, maybe leaving a little too much in the tank for Brogan Austin. I don't know if that's necessarily true because we do have about four minutes left. And I mean, Matt does still look composed. It doesn't look like he's by any means crawling, but you can see that Brogan really is closing very, very hard. Now for the first time in 20 plus miles, Kyle, we actually see a competitor closing in and we are watching something that could end up being a race as Brogan Austin, we believe, is the athlete in the pink shoes, rolling down there in the background. You see a little bit of a grimace on Yano's face. This could be a tight one. I wonder if Matt knows that he is there. I would hope that someone is yelling behind him. Maybe he hears everyone getting a little bit louder. But Brogan is getting bigger and bigger on our screen. And they probably have just over a half mile left in the race. So that might be enough real estate. The camera view does get a little bit tricky uh, to fully understand just how much distance that is between them. But Brogan has his eyes on him. There are two distinctly different body languages here that I'm witnessing, Kyle, and it looks like Yano is holding on and Brogan is charging. And that is a definitively different perspective on their mental status, their physical status, and everything else. We may have ourselves a very, very close finish here. And as you mentioned, a 15.08 relative to a 16.28 last 5K, that minute 20 second gap just got shattered. So Brogan, the Iowa boy being coached by Tom Tinman Schwartz is just rolling, looking unbelievably strong right now. He's got uh, Matt now right on him together. And the question is, how is Matt gonna respond? And if you're Brogan, I think you wanna just go. You don't even look, you just make it hurt. And the look down by Yano as Brogan passed him was signed like a Jan Ulrich and a Lance Armstrong competition up the Alpe d'Huez. It says, you got it, I can't do it. Matt now just has to adjust. He's got to just look to see if he can find one more gear in him. But if you're Brogan, you just got it. This is the most important part of the race. When you make that pass is you just need to put the pedal down. And somebody we really haven't talked about. I mean, we did our research and we know enough about Brogan Austin. He was just one of the other guys in that chase pack. And here we have someone who just decided to throw down. Somehow he had this left in his legs. And now we had almost anointed Matt Yano as the US champ. And right now with very few kilometers to go less than, oh my gosh, two, about one and a half kilometers to go here. 
we are looking at a distinct dominant last basically quarter mile as he just passed the 26 mile mark here and this is brogan austin he will be barring anything happening over the last 0 0.1 miles now this is without a doubt the biggest win as he holds on this final couple hundred meters for brogan austin the drake alum it's only a second marathon ever he was unbelievable in indiana uh, at the monumental half and he's turning the corner he sees the finish line i'm sure something in his training tells him that he was ready to run fast and this isn't too much of a shock for him but i think he shocked the field now he's waiting he keeps looking over that shoulder he, probably as much in disbelief as anything else as there's no way he thought he was going to make up that kind of ground on an athlete the caliber of matt yano but here he is into the finish line just hyping up the crowd excitement a big time marathon win for brogan austin he will be your u.s champion here in the marathon at the Cal International Marathon course taking a big win and you know what that $20,000 paycheck is going to feel pretty good when he's holding that a little bit later this is what the sport is about this is why we love it a guy who's just moved up to the marathon and found his niche and completely succeeding in it and Matt Yano having done run about 25.8 miles by himself, finishing there in second. Josh Izuski, 213.15, and his teammate Joe Stillen just behind him, 213.19. Really great day for the Zap Fitness guys. And Brendan Gregg now coming in, it's 213. That's got to be a big PR for him as well. And Brian Schrader, an awesome debut for the Saucony Freedom Track Club athlete. Anthony Casales coming in with another 213 for him. Now what a deep field here, Kyle. Look at all those 212, the 212 and all these 213s. Most of these guys having never touched that 213 mark before. So what a phenomenal day, phenomenal set of performances. All the way down to eighth place finish. They're still in that 213 range. And just to point out, Brendan Gregg. And I'll, I'll give you a reason why I keep talking about him in a second, but previous PR of 2.18.30, now a 2.13 marathoner. Unbelievable. Yeah, just a great day for so many. Really, really exciting. It's always a good feeling to see guys who didn't necessarily win throwing up their hands at the finish line. Uh, something that I always like to say is you don't have to finish first to win. The fist pump means something real. And here we go, Steph Bruce doing what she can to close that gap between she and Emma Bates. Will we see? We thought the gap was enormous for Yano. The gap looked enormous for Bates. But we never know. That's why they run the race, Kyle. Yeah, you know, we definitely, as you said, anointed Matt a little bit early as the, the champion. And I don't necessarily think that he slowed down too much as much as Brogan just really started to roll. He timed things well, and as you were saying, once you can taste someone in front of you, it's a huge mental boost and can really propel you to the finish. Because at the end of the day, running five minute miles, a single five minute mile, is not necessarily the upper limits of how fast these guys can run. Um, many of these guys, four minute milers, they can kick. And you see the gap is closing a little bit. Now, Steph may have left herself a little bit too much time as she did run the last 5K split a little faster than Emma Bates. But Bates still just that metronome out front through 35K. Again, 42 kilometers is a marathon, so with 7K to go, these guys are still motoring along. But Bruce having a tough time really carving too much out of that lead by Bates. You see Sam Rooker falling off the pace a bit as she sat there in second place for a little bit. Now up front, here is Emma Bates as she continues to motor on again. You know, for a debut marathon, looking at somewhere between this 227, 228 marker would just be a tremendous, tremendous victory for her and really a testament to her training as we Maybe had a little slight technical difficulty there up, up front. This is 
all great technology that we're actually able to be out on these motorcycles and, and showing you so much of the races out there today. But Steph Bruce now continuing to motor on. I wonder, you know, I'm curious if do, do she and Ben have like in-house like like spousal rivalries when it comes to these distances? Yeah, I you know I wonder where Ben is out there today right now, but. They seem to be pretty supportive of each other. And at this point in Ben's career, he's actually moved into a little bit of an assistant coaching role with uh, Hoka NAZ Elite. And so for him, you know, I'm sure he's probably more invested in Steph's uh, potential today than his own. And I think that's what makes a good marriage. So again, Steph there, as you saw, she just passed that 24 mile marker in about 217, right in that kind of range, which is puts us right smack dab in that 229-ish range for a finishing time. So having just run the New York Marathon and done quite well, maybe left a little bit in the tank there in New York. She's back, having run two marathons in I don't know how many weeks that is, but it's single digits, guys. So her PR is 229.35. If she can find a way to squeak under that, it'd be quite a remarkable feat given her performance just recently at New York. You know, recently I had a conversation with uh, Olympic Australian marathoner Lee Troop and talked about sort of the idea that marathons are so infrequent that you really hope for that day. It's, that, it's the perfect temperature, it's the perfect wind, it's your perfect fitness, and it all works together. And I think today is that perfect day. Now, you might argue, had Steph not run New York and waited for this day, could she have had something more in the tank and run even faster? That'll ne we'll never know. It's all gonna be hypothesis. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think an interesting point with Steph is that when a lot of us look at the results from her in New York running 2.30, we think, oh, you know, Steph had a fine day. That's a, you know, 2.30 marathons, nothing to laugh at at all. But for her, it was a huge disappointment. And that's why she's reached the caliber that she has as an athlete, because she's that hard on herself. She's our harshest critic. And when she came back to Arizona after New York and took a few easy days off. She was the one who went to coach Ben Rosario and said, I want to double back. I want to do CIM as well. And that's just that mentality is a little glimpse into why she's the successful athlete that she is. And speaking of success, I think we've seen something of a success here in an inaugural marathon for Emma Bates. Just continuing to hold form, hold place, and does not show signs of slowing at all. For Emma right now, if she can just find one of those guys to run with, you know, just having some company would go a really long way. It's been a, a lonely 26.2 miles for her so far and just having someone come up and run next to her and just help inch her along could be the final boost that she needs in the last 10 minutes here and I'm guessing right there the mat being laid down laid down across the road is that a kilometer marker I'm not exactly sure which mile marker that was we're lo looking for a mile probably 20 Five, I believe, here very, very soon. That may have been a kilometer marker back there. So mile 25 should be approaching here on this straight stretch as Emma Bates looks to become your 2018 U.S. Marathon champion. I had the same conversation about Matt Yano here at the same spot just a few minutes ago. So it's all yet to be seen. You see that through the 40 kilometer mark there, 220, 24, just, just absolutely crushing it out there today. Uh, no questions about her fitness and preparation for an event like this. And what this tells me too, Kyle, is that her nutrition was on point as well. Yeah, which is, you know, obviously something that she hasn't had quite as much time to experiment with. But she 
seems to have got it figured out this first time out. Maybe she is one of those lucky iron stomachs, but she is now within the 26th mile. She just has to hold on, you know, someone as we've seen can close hard in the, the later stages of this race, but if she can just completely maintain that composure, I think that uh, she's holding on for quite a nice debut here. Yeah, while built to be a marathoner at this point, it's uh, recognized by both she, her fiance, and, and others around her. She has that experience of winning a 10 kilometer NC2A championship on the track, and that doesn't mean just, you know, just as a distance runner, it doesn't mean she doesn't have wheels. She absolutely has wheels. She can take that form and cover a lot of ground very quickly. So I fully expect her to be able to. She sees that clock. Now the finish is a little tricky. You don't see the finish line until you're basically on the last home stretch. But if she can turn that over, she could dip under this 228 mark and be a legitimate 227 marathoner. You know, this might be even in the 226s perhaps. Yet. No, she, certainly uh, she is rolling. Steph Bruce is only running a few seconds of faster right now. And with that time gap of a minute 24, you would think that it's a little bit too much with uh, too little running left. But again, we will see. Uh, I think that Cameron right now is probably jumping up and down. Who knows where he is out on the course, but this is a great thing for the Idaho Distance Project. Uh, you know, they're a small group right now up and coming, and it's something that Emma and Cam have been thinking about for a long time. It's something that they've wanted to do, and he's proving himself now as a great coach, fully capable, and I wouldn't be shocked to see quite a few people reach out and wanna get some insight from him since he knows how to coach marathoners. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that the state of Idaho offers a lot of varying terrain. Pretty great training weather. You got some a little bit of altitude built in there in places that you can that you can go and, and uh, presents itself to be a, a, a great possibility for a lot of athletes to go out there and train. So that Idaho Distance Project could be something we're talking about for years to come in this marathon space. hear the music and the cheers down as we get close to the finish line here near the capital in the state capital of California. We're getting now towards the finish of this 2018 U.S. Marathon Championships hosted by Cal International Marathon. There you're seeing on the screen in sixth place is Bridget Vines or Leones and she was an athlete that I highlighted as possible dark horse for a high finish earlier in the race because she was a, a very successful good college runner but she took some time off right after college actually to attend dental school and now running for the Atlanta Track Club uh, she ran 72:31 for a half marathon in November at Las Vegas and is just really blossoming as an athlete so this is a great opportunity for her to lower that PR just a little bit more and it's exciting to see for an athlete who took some time to come back and run so well. And we see here, Emma actually, she got swallowed up just a wee bit by a couple of athletes. And I think she just said, nope, I'm ready to, to push it into the finish line now. And she looks to be totally composed, totally ready to cross that finish line with arms raised as the newly minted United States Marathon Champion. Just watch that clock ticking by 225.30 as things tend to, not tend to, but as things do proceed here toward the finish line, Kyle, it's looking more and more like there might be a way, maybe, 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 of squeaking under 227, but the likelihood is we'll be in the 227s as we get closer to the finish line here. And again, we're noting her singlet run for campfire relief and running for a great cause and really cool that she's able to come out and wear the singlet but I will be shocked if she is running unsponsored for very much longer now that she is fully showing just how great of a marathoner she is. 
I think this is the beginning of what we're going to see now as a long and successful career here on the roads, Kyle, as Emma Bates rolling in here toward this finish line. Four hundred meters to go. She can hear the music. She will turn the corner, see the finish line. Sub two twenty eight. If she closes hard, there it is at mile twenty six. So we've got less than two tenths of a mile to go. That's less than a quarter. It's about three hundred and fifty ish meters. How fast, 300, 350 meters, how fast can she finish that? If she really grinds it out now, we might see that sub 228. This is an exciting moment for Emma, a $40,000 payday, and just solidifying herself as a threat for years to come in the marathon showing what she knew all along that she was built for this. And she'll be taking a left here. That's not her final turn though. She'll have to come back around, make one more. Oh, apparently it is. I lost my place on the course. And here is Emma Bates, your 2018 US champ will break the tape. Doing everything in her power to win this race, draw attention to the Campfire Relief Fund. And welcome to marathoning, Miss Bates. 228.19. That's a good place to start. Just running her own race from the gun never scared of the distance, took a chance and made it happen. And there's Steph Bruce there. Now she did close up a little bit of that gap, but left a little too much on the road as she hooks the left here into this finish line. She'll be turning this corner and voila, there she is, Steph Bruce. Her personal best coming in today was 229.35, so hopefully she can just squeak under there, drop a few seconds off, which is incredible to do when just 28 days ago she was finishing the New York City Marathon. Nothing like setting a personal best. <laughs> Three or four, four weeks after running the New York Marathon, and she might need a little breathing room there at the end. What an exciting day, Kyle, highlighted by just tremendous, <laughs> tremendous races. That's our friend Kevin Ullman there. You can see him getting in front of that camera. Kevin will eventually be ready to take on some interviews and stuff. You can see our winner. There is Emma Bates. And, you know, goes without saying that she now has the automatic standard for the Olympic trials be really excited to see how she does among her more established peers and also very exciting to get that Olympic a standard out of the way which means that she doesn't even necessarily need to do another marathon between now and the trials all she needs is a top three spot and she would qualify there's Sam Rooker a huge personal best by eight minutes for Sam Rooker extremely excited for the nurse out of Philadelphia so third and fourth finishing up there, which means that Sarah Crouch, we haven't heard from in a little bit, not exactly sure where where she has finished up or uh, where she is out there. There's Lyons. A huge breakthrough for her, about a five and a half minute personal best. She is just continuing to excel now after her stint in dental school. And more
more and more ladies finishing up here. Just a tremendous finishing there. Your top three back to celebrate. You know, usually what I like to do after running 26.2 is run some more. That's uh, <laughs> called the cool down. Oh, okay. That was a big eight minute PR for Bethany Sachselbin, who I will need to find out how to properly pronounce her last yeah, we, name we, because she we is apologize. getting good and I have a feeling that I'll have to say it more in the future. I mean, just what a perfect day out there. You see the top six finishers all just enjoying the day, enjoying the moment. Bates, Bruce, Roker, Lee, Lyons, Sockleben. You know, Kyle, we thought that it, you might even be able to win today with a 231. That's definitely not the case. Yeah, the way things panned out, uh, especially the way the tone was set early, you know, you needed that sub 230 to be a contender. And Emma just really made it happen uh, for herself. And she dragged along some women with her by saying, this is not going to be a tactical day. We are going to run fast. And after some valiant moves early, there's Megan Christian coming into line 232.49. Another 30 second personal best for her. She continues to be extremely consistent. And the men's race results up on this. We watch more ladies come to the finish line here. Brogan Austin, who you saw there with just an outstanding last, t basically 10 kilometers. At least, uh, at least in the seven and a half kilometer range, just absolutely threw down. Closed a nearly two minute gap behind Matt Yano for the win, 212.39. Another newcomer to the scene and absolutely crushing it. Again, We're very excited about that third and fourth place debut for Josh Izuski and Joe Stillen. Just, and as well, Brian Trader in sixth place. It's just awesome to see so many guys immediately coming out and showing what they're capable of, especially doing it with a relatively conservative first 20 miles before things really began to open up. The tactics of racing out there today were on display. Some worked, some didn't. But nevertheless, we saw a lot of fantastic PRs, great races, just exactly what this U.S. Marathon Championships is meant to elicit. Show us, show us your best, give us your best.